development of the adrenal gland like many other glands as we have discussed about the pituitary where you have got a neural component and a glandular component pancreas has got a exocrine and a neuroendocrine component thyroid has got a follicular and a parafollicular which again is a more of a neuroendocrine component same adrenal has got a glandular component as well as the neural component so it's a dual origin organ and both components then meet with each other to form basically the cortex and the medulla from the embryonic stage so as discussed we have got the cortex which produces cortisol aldosterone and dhes and the medulla which produces the catecholamine and we'll discuss how both of them interact with each other and that also becomes very very important subsequently now remember adrenal is one gland which has very large compared to the body surface body size at birth why is adrenal so large in the fetal period and the immediate newborn period because in the fetal periods the fetal adrenal is taking more most of the part uh, of adrenal so it is like uh, the 20 times higher than the uh, adult body so and the fetal adrenal is roughly same as the adult adrenal so what it means that if you make a ratio of the fetal adrenal to the size which is basically like only 3 kilograms versus a adult who is 60 kilograms you of course have a 20 times ratio in terms of the per kilogram mass of adrenals so adrenals are pretty large so to speak at the time of birth and that is why if you want to look at adrenals and somebody says i cannot see adrenals at birth it means they are usually absent So, what are the two organs which are very easy to three organs which are very easy to identify in the newborn period, and, and then may be difficult in later on life? Adrenal thyroid gonads. Yes. So, gonads means gonad. Of course, testes you don't need. So, ovaries. So, ovaries, uterus. Uterus is very easily identifiable. Thyroid is very easily identifiable, and adrenal is also very easily identifiable. So, if the radiologist is saying that he cannot see an adrenal. and you are suspecting adrenal insufficiency you are mostly talking about adrenal hypoplasia congenita because ch hyperplasia it will be big and you will not miss it in that regard so that is something which is important in development now what about the genetic regulation so the development of the adrenal happens from the urogenital ridge now from the same urogenital ridge you have got two more important organs which are developing So, Dhari, what are the genes and what are the developments happening from this urogenital ridge? The three organs. So, very importantly. So, basically, that's why you've got a lot of overlap between the adrenal development, the gonadal development, and the renal development, which happens. So, this urogenital ridge typically appears very early. So, it's like a mesenchymal tissue by around four weeks of life. and these are the very early ones like wnt the hedgehog pathway then all these are very early mesenchymal tissue development which are there then around 6 weeks you have got a separation which is happening and we are talk about the adrenal gonad the bipotential gonad which is developing and this is against a lot of genes again so wt1 also play the role here and then of course wt1 play the major role in the development of kidneys so first from the urogenital ridge you have got the adrenal and the gonad developing and the kidneys going off from that regards now around 8 weeks you have got the basic adrenal structure developing so why is this 8 week very important weba what is the role of adrenals at 8 weeks of life so if you let's put it this way if you have no adrenal will the baby be survive so progesterone is not produced by the adrenals progesterone is produced by the placenta so you have got patients with adrenal hypoplasia congenita you got patients who have complete ch who don't produce any adrenal hormones so they will survive so adrenal is not essential for survival think about it what does cortisol do um, the maintenance of the this uh, blood sugar glucocorticoid so where does the baby get the glucose from so it doesn't need it what does aldosterone do sodium regulation so sodium regulation is coming from the mother dhea it doesn't really matter 
So basically, the, you can have zero adrenal function and the baby will survive. But a very, very important function, and that is why this eight weeks becomes important, especially in the female fetus. At eight weeks, the adrenal does a very important role. Prevents the? Yes. So this is the time that if you do not have this cortisol, it will not suppress the production of the androgens. And this androgens will cause a lot of virilization. So this 8 to 12 weeks is a very important window for females to prevent virilization. And this is what we'll talk about, how those enzymes shift. So you will have some shift which is happening in terms of the enzymes which are expressed. So cortisol will get formed in that regard. What's the major role of the fetal adrenals? Dr. Manoj, you said that it's so big, but what is its role? Mainly for, uh, production. So, estrogen products may be there. So, basically, you can say simply that adrenals are the factories to give the raw material to the placenta and the mother to produce estriol. So, they produce DHEAs, which is converted by the placenta using aromatase into estriol, which goes into the mother. So, estriol levels are a marker of adrenal functions. And we know that estriol levels are measured as part of triple marker and other aspects as well. So if your estriol level is low, there are so many other causes. It may also be, we have seen patients who were found to have a MPHD in which there was no production of DHEAs or adrenal insufficiency. They can also present like that. So that's a classical scenario. Now from here, we know that gonad, of course, will develop using, depending upon the uh, genotype, it will decide whether it's going towards the testicular development or the ovarian development using the SRY, the SOX9, DAX1, and all those things will develop. While DAX1 will be very, very important for the development of the adrenal gland. And this is something which is important. DAX and NR5A1 will result in the development of the adrenal gland. Now, what does DAX1 do? What is the antagonism between DAX1 and NR5A1? Uh, so, DAX1 suppresses the NR5A1 and Yes. So, they have a mutually contradictory role in that perspective. So, DAX1 plays an important role in terms of allowing the gonadal development till 11 and then it suppresses it. But the major role in terms of adrenal will, of course, come from the adrenal development as well as transfer of the HDL cholesterol. So, when we'll talk about CAH, more in terms of the adrenal pseudogenesis, we'll discuss that there are two sources of cholesterol. One is endogenous and the other is exogenous. Exogenous you can get using the LDL receptor or the HDL receptor. So these two DAX1 and NR5A1, they play an important role predominantly on the HDL metabolism and they have an antagonistic effect. They of course are important for development of the gonad, development of the adrenals and the development of the gonadotrophs. So they also have a pituitary function. So they have a complicated uh, phenotype which will result into uh, adrenal insufficiency along with uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And in certain scenarios, if it's DAX1 overexpression, you will have a DSD, which will also happen. And NR5A1 will also cause a DSD-like picture. And most patients with NR5A1 will have a gonadal phenotype rather than an adrenal phenotype. Now, from here, the further growth. So now, if you remember pituitary, we talked about the, uh, the primordial genes like Sonic, Hedgehog, and the LHX3. Then we talked about HESX1. Then came the specific ones like PROP1, PIT1. Here on now, the adrenal gland is formed. So from here, you have got three important ones which are responsible for the production, which is IGF2, FGF2, and POMC. Now, what is the role of POMC, Vibha? POMC from the POMC, the ACTH. So that is why it's a very important regulator. So you need ACTH, then only your adrenal functions will happen from that regards. And this results in the development of the mature adrenal and then POMC is the main functional regulator in that regard. So if you do not have POMC, adrenals will be formed, but they will be small. And then they will not act in that regard. So this is something to remember. Now, we have discussed about the urogenital ridge and the three organs which develop. And we know very clearly that adrenals are developing actually at the top. And the kidneys basically are on the lower side. Now, what happens with time is that the gonads will descend 
and the kidneys will ascend. So it's not that the adrenals were always there along with the kidneys. I talked about in the last slide that the uh, kidney is below and you have got the equal time development of the gonad and the adrenal. So they were closer. Now the gonads go down and kidneys go up. And therefore, the final position of adrenal or suprarenal is just because of the relative migration. The adrenals are not migrating. It's mainly the gonadal descent and the ascent of the kidneys, which is responsible for this process. So now we've talked a bit about development in terms of the structure, but what about function? And we need to understand what the adrenal function at what age, and that will tell us about the functional status of the adrenal at different age groups. So we've got the fetus, which has got a huge fetal zone, a big fetal zone. There is an intermediate zone and a very small definitive or a adrenal, adrenal type of a picture. Now, basically what fetus is doing, and Manoj has already said that its major role is to give DHEAS. Now, if you have a basic remembrance of the steroidogenic pathway, if you want to produce DHEAS, you need a lot of 3-beta-HSD. Once you have 3-beta-HSD, you do not want to have a lot of, and then you want to have a lot of activity of 17 uh, CYP17 and sulfonyl transferase. So 3-beta-HSD, it will behave like a 3-beta-HSD deficiency. And then you have got more 17-hydroxylase activity, which will shift it towards, so it will behave like a 3-beta-HSD deficiency. The major metabolite there will be DHEA, which will be then sulfated into DHEAS. So the major production here is DHEAS. From there in childhood, your fetal zone will start to involute and it may take a couple of months for involution. What has its what is the implication of this in the fetal in the postnatal age group? So in the postnatal age group, there will be the high activity of uh, uh, there will be low activity of 17 uh, hydroxylase mm -hmm. will produce. So you will have persistence of this fetal type of adrenal. So you will have a lot of abnormal steroids which are circulating. And you will have a lot of sulfated products. Now, these sulfated products are not active. So your levels will be erroneous, especially if you are measuring using a amino acid. So that's why you have to be very, very cautious in the first one or two months of life when you are doing these assays for adrenal hormones that you assess specifically after extraction. That is, you remove the sulfation and measure. And because there is overlapping steroids, you should avoid using amino acid go more for the GCMS-based assays, which are structure-based and not the, uh, the immune-based in that regards. Now, when childhood, your fetal zone becomes less, glomerulosa becomes main. So now your major hormone, which is being produced by the adrenal from DHEAS, is shifting towards the cortisol, which will become the most important from that regard. So what is happening here in that regards is that now your 3-beta HSD will start to wake up you will have decrease in the 17 hydroxylase or so you can say that you have got less number of electrons. Electron donors are less. So you are stopping at cortisol. You are not producing DHEAs. So the so-called adrenarchy is basically the increased availability of electron donors, which is not happening here. And your predominant product is cortisol. Now, remember, you already are producing aldosterone. But I am saying cortisol as a predominant product because the amount of cortisol produced is, let's say, if, even if it's 10 milligrams, the aldosterone is 0.1 milligram. So it's 100 times more. So this is something. So 100 times cortisol is the major product here. Now, what happens later on on puberty is that you've got a greater number of electron donors. And these electron donors then ensure that you have got the next step of 17 hydroxylase, which is 17 lyase which causes production of DHEAS. And this is what we talk about as puberty or adrenarchy, which is happening in that perspective. So now reticularis zone will become more prominent. High 17 hydroxyl then lies and 3 beta relatively will be less in this area, resulting in a predominant DHEAS. So fetal adrenal is producing predominantly DHEAS. While in the intermediate period, cortisol secretion becomes 10 milligram, it remains roughly around that sort of a level. 
but DHEA starts to pick up. So if you talk about our adult individual, which is the most common hormone that adrenal produces, DHEA is the largest. How much? Roughly? How many milligrams? 15 to 20 milligrams will be there. But which is the most effective steroidogenic organ in the body? So we have talked about the DHEAS, we have talked about the cortisol and aldosterone, but is adrenal the most effective steroidogenic uh, uh, organ of the body or do we have any other thing which is more effective in producing steroids? For the same mass, producing that much. So what is the big source of what are the other steroids which we do? No? Yeah. So there is a particular area, a region, a tissue or whatever you want to say, which produces much more steroid as compared to adrenal during a particular time. Estrogen. No? Progesterone. Corpus luteum. Progesterone. progesterone. The progesterone is a huge one. And corpus luteum is a simple, very, very small structure. It produces huge. That's why it becomes yellow. Why does the adrenal becomes yellow in adeno in the those okay. forms of that? The lipoid hyperplasia is because of fat. But corpus luteum already has got so much fat accumulated that it is already known as corpus luteum. So yellow cyst, this is what corpus luteum is. So corpus luteum is the most effective area in the body which can produce a large amount of steroid. It only acts after the luteal phase. But here, of course, reticularis zone produces the maximum within the adrenal, which is in the form of DHEA. So you can all go and have a look at our website, our courses which are available and the mobile application. So